Well, I feel privileged that uh, I'm creating the early methods of my grandmothers or the grand grandmothers from the village. And um, just recreating what they created back then. But of course, back then, they were only making things for themselves to use, utilitarian uh, pottery, like the chili bowls, stew bowls, dough bowls for mixing their dough in, and water jars for carrying their water. Because just lately, uh, late 50s, we just barely got the running water in the village. So all the early years, they used to carry their water uh, from the river. And then there used to be a man, uh, they used to bring water to the village, and that's how the uh, people of the village would get water for their cooking or uh, washing or whatever they used it for. And uh, I remember at one time, our, my grandmother told me that uh, they used to walk down to the river to get the water, and uh, my grandma used to uh, carry her water on her head, uh, a water jar. So I usually concave the bottom parts of a uh, water jar so that uh, perhaps maybe it might be used again in the village. And um, at one point, uh, some of the girls that she used to walk down to the river with that were carrying pails. I guess their grandpa bought a pail from uh, town someplace. And my uh, grandmother wanted one like that. But my grandparents, I guess, didn't have a way of getting to town or going to uh, the city to buy anything like that. So uh, what her grandpa did was he drilled holes on each side of the jar, of our water jar, and put a leather thong on there and turned it into a pail so she didn't have to carry it on her head again. So that really tells me that um, it's great to uh, recreate the older styles because that was the only reason that pottery was ever made from the beginning is for their utilitarian uses. And uh, like uh, in the early uh, Mesa Verde area, early potteries were found and that was almost like their only furniture or their only utilitarian uh, pieces in the uh, homes. Because uh, from the very beginning of life, uh, pottery was always presented to them to get them into the world and uh, survival, eating from a bowl, which uh, brings me to another statement, or I don't know how to put it, uh, is that uh, Santa Mingus were usually cut. In the early years, uh, people from home used to eat from one bowl, and all the school, school uh, students and all used to tease them and send them into one dish. That's what they used to tease them with, because they all ate from what that one chili bowl. And nowadays, it's all uh, personalized. But it's great to recreate the so-called uh, art. Later years, uh, I, it's now turned into art rather than um, utilitarian pieces because the, uh, when the people, or the new people came to the, world, the side of the world, they started looking at it as an art form rather than utilitarian. So uh, now today, that's what, is what we recreate, it's uh, the uh, art. But I still do at times at home, uh, I still produce pieces for the village use that the people use that can actually use. We have dough bowls at the house that uh, my sisters uh, use for mixing their tortilla dough in. And the larger ones, they don't bother using uh, the large dough bowls anymore because uh, they're too huge and too hard to make. But I do also remember that grandma used to have uh, a line of uh, dough bowls sitting on the top shelf and ladies would come by and borrow her dough bowl when uh, they're ready to make some dough for uh, upcoming feast day. And they would, you know, take it home to their house and put it on their head. And that's how they would carry the adobo over their head. And, um, and then they'll be uh, mixing their dough on the floor because they didn't have furniture back then, so they would uh, sit on the floor. And one of the ladies at one time, uh, when she already finished uh, mixing her dough, she wanted to get up, so she rested her hands on the rim of the bowl and split it in half. <laughs> That bowl, uh, when it came back to my grandmother, uh, we helped her glue it back together because uh, I knew at the time uh, that glue will patch it up and all. So it worked well. It uh, survived for a few more years until uh, somebody sold it. <laughs> and then uh, nowadays, you know, uh, the older pots are now considered the very rare uh, art of the village. And I feel great that I can sort of reproduce that old style but um, it's totally up to the uh, collectors, the museums and all to decide that I still do recreate 
from the materials that uh, our grandmothers used to use. And I still go to the same uh, hills and uh, places where they got their clays from. The clays I can sort of get from almost any place, but one area for sand that's mixed into the clays to prevent it from crackage. And then another area where we get our white slip, the magical white slip uh, that turns our paints, uh, plant juices black. It's the only uh, white that will work, and it is from our area, from San Domingo area. But Coach T and San Domingo uh, used to, what well, San Domingo's uh, do share with the Coach T people. And uh, when they did rent out of the white slip at Coach T, we were there to sort of help them out. And I'm still supplying a few more uh, coach tins, uh, but not that many because I'm, I don't really have much of the white. Where it used to be, it was dug out by uh, people from uh, Sicily that moved on onto our land. And uh, they had seen uh, the older grandpas and uh, grandpas digging for that white clay, so they wanted to help them out. So they brought over a, a, a backhoe and dug it out, and they over dug the whole area and, uh, and dug it all out. And then so they used to sell it to the San Domingos and to the coach teams and, um, because this is the only thing that works very, very well. And then when I came along, when I went back to uh, the traditional style, I sort of ran into a problem because I didn't have the white slip uh, for my pottery. At the time, uh, in the, uh, probably in the 70s, I used to do stoneware that I learned in school, uh, how to throw on the wheel and uh, a lot of glazes uh, that was the Institute of American Arts in Santa Fe. And by when I got home, I wanted to do more pottery, but uh, I couldn't reproduce any more of that because I, don't ha I didn't have the uh, gas kiln to uh, do the firings or the uh, clays that we used to throw on the wheel. So grandma came in, and that's where I give credit to my grandmother that uh, she showed me all the uh, places where they used to get their clays. We would walk up to the hills because at the time I didn't have a vehicle, so we would have to walk up to the hills and gather some of the clays. And I'll be pulling a little red wagon because that was uh, the only thing that we could carry the clay in. It was heavy and all. And um, so she showed me how to mix the clays and all. And as a matter of fact, the first firing that I ever did was in my uh, fields where my grandpa or her dad, so it would be my great grandpa, used to uh, plant chilies. It was this chili field area. It's where I did my very first firing, a uh, San Domingo style. And up today, I still have the canteen that I fired there very first time. And I was really happy with the results because uh, the materials that uh, she had showed me really worked. The plant juices that turned nice and black. And at first, um, when I was painting them, it had a different look, a different color. But when we fired, it turned nice and black. So that's when I really got interested and got into the more traditional style. The grandmother from my mother's side was uh, Niseta Calabasa, but uh, she used to do huge pots. But of course, like back then, they never uh, sighted their pots because they weren't making it for anybody else but themselves. And then uh, the grandpa would take them to San Felipe, go to trade for food and things like that for feast days and things like uh, that. And then they would go to other Pueblos, uh, San Diego, because further down to Isleta, they would do a lot of trading with their pottery. And then the grandma from my father's side, uh, Andrea Ortiz, her I got to know very well because um, she just barely passed away uh, in 80-something. She went to 102. From the very beginning, it used to be just, a, they called it the so-called spinach juice. and. Um, Spinach was mostly to eat, and I always thought maybe perhaps the person that uh, discovered the uh, black paint, a potter who was working on her pottery, had white pots, and maybe perhaps she went inside to have some lunch, and her lunch was probably spinach. So uh, when she went back to work at her pot, she had uh, juices on her fingers and started to hinder her pottery. And next thing, when she fired her potter, perhaps she found black fingerprints on her pot. Maybe that might have been the discovery of uh, the plant juices as paint. So it only works on the white that we have from San Domingo. I have tried the uh, black paint on other whites and it just doesn't seem to turn or doesn't seem to work at all. So I've uh, done a lot of um, experiments. 
and the um, the juice is very. It has to be applied very uh, liquidly, or how, how would I say, it? liquid, because when it's too thick, it doesn't sink into the um, to the uh, clay surface. So then I've uh, also started to boil other different plants, other plants that are surrounding areas of the village, and uh, finding out that uh, any kind of plant juices will work over our white. If it's the right white, then it'll work. But if it's not the right white, then the black paint will not work at all. And also the spinach or the plant juices does not work over the red. But when I want to create that black and red, it's another older style. It's a very hard uh, to do. Then I would mix red and white together so that the black will perhaps work over that area. So My paint brushes are simply made by yucca stamps. So using a yucca stem and uh, chewing out the bristles or uh, turning it into a paintbrush gives me the extra brushes for my pottery. And very slowly, and we try to do the lines. And as you can see, it's very hard to do the uh, lines because it's a very light color. Sometimes I don't even know if I got it all filled in right. We usually find out after firing if we've missed a place. So this is how the true color of uh, the spinach is before fired. And it does magically turn uh, black in the firing. Right now there is a hill that the uh, people created, um, the people that dug out the white area. So that hill we go through with our fingers uh, looking for pieces of the white. It's always great to find a thumb sized piece because that is gold to us. The small pieces will really go a long way. And we also apply the white very watery. And it takes something like good 10 to 20 coats of the white over on the pot. I don't ever rush the uh, apl application of the white on the pots. I would let it dry for uh, maybe a couple of hours or so before I apply another slip over it. If the white applies onto the pot, real nicely white, then I know that the paint, the spinach juice will not work. And we try not to make any mistakes. Any mistakes that I make or uh, using this plant juices over the white, it's on permanent. Or if I can't catch it in time, then I can turn it into something else. Or uh, either um, whiten the lines or straighten the lines out. I'm glad to see some of that, those mistake, kind of mistakes or uh, mishaps on older pots because the same thing happens to me when I'm uh, working with my pots. The base part here is the red that uh, almost any potter uses and it comes from the Alavahada Hills area. And this red will also be, uh, if polished with the stone, will turn nice and shiny as uh, something like the northern uh, Santa Clara San Defonso area. Uh, it's what they use for their shiny <coughs> red pots. But at San Domingo, we only use it as a decoration. And then um, also uh, perhaps the reason that we use it on the base part and the inside is because that's the only place that we can handle it while it's still raw. Because if you touch the white areas, fingerprints will show up. And then the designs are all traditional uh, designs of the village. I try very hard not to uh, do new things. And if I do go try to do new things, then I try to stay within the area I use uh, a lot of the Mesa Verde uh, patterns and then the uh, members area patterns and uh, a lot of uh, the game animals because uh, they used to paint whatever uh, they used to eat, survival things, you know. So the game animals was the number one thing, uh, the deer, the ram, the antelope. And then uh, my grandma always said, always include food for them. So we try to put uh, a plant things on there for them and water or whatever. And then, uh, of course, we do the fish also. We, when uh, the Rio Grande was, used to be active, we used to uh, do a lot of fish in there. And then the circles that I have on this jar are my grandmother's uh, favorite. She has always painted the circles on her pots, um, representing the stars or the moons. You know. And then this piece here would be um, what they call the Aguilar style. The whole pot is all white, uh, slipped white, and then painted in with a more of the red. 
It was another uh, style that uh, a family of uh, the Cate sisters, one sister would do the red lines and another sister would fill in the uh, black areas. And then a man that was married into the Cate sister was the only person that used to jump on the train and go sell their pottery. And uh, when he sells to galleries uh, or uh, museums in town, uh, they always uh, gave him the credit because he was an Aguilar person. And little by little, uh, they started calling it the Aguilar style, and yet it was created by the Cate sisters. So I've been trying to correct that for many years. And they had always made the uh, same height of uh, water jars. They always counted their coils, is what my grandma used to tell me. And at one time, they, uh, made a whole wagon load of our water jars and they took it to uh, a trading post that was right close to San Domingo, the Domingo trading post, and traded it for a brand new wagon. That was exciting for my grandma. She always thought, maybe I can do that too, make a, a lot of pots I could trade. <laughs> and then um, the same, the other style that they did was a lot of, uh, or they call it the negative form, where it's all a lot of uh, almost white lines. But again, from the very beginning, uh, the pots are all white and you paint in all the black areas. It'll be easier if we can find some white that will work over the black. Then I can just simply paint the whole pot black and go over it with the white. But it just doesn't look right at all. It's the reverse that makes it uh, more, um, more of a unique piece. Uh. Well, I've done some mica pots too. I, I used to do a lot of mica earlier years. Uh, and I always thought that they didn't have, they didn't look right, that they didn't look finished. And also at one time I painted one with red over the mica, so it have some designs and that took some kind of award and it belongs to uh, the School of Laboratory or something like that. And I think it's downstairs here in the collection. It's mica painted with red over it because we can't uh, use black paint over it. I tried doing that. But it did, at one time it worked well on a bowl that I made for the um, the Hamish people that were being brought back from uh, the Harvard University. They were gonna rebury them down here at the uh, Pecos area. So I made a bowl and a canteen, and I fired those two pieces together, and uh, I said, whichever comes out, I'll give it to the people that were gonna be reburied. Mainly, uh, uh, the birds is what uh, the ladies would paint. The, I guess it was a little more open for them to paint the birds rather than the game animals because uh, they, the ladies never went hunting so they didn't actually get to see the actual uh, deer standing. Seemed like all the early older pots are mostly geometric designs, uh, more dis uh, recognizable of the uh, San Domingo patterns, which were also shared among the uh, Northern people, Cochitis and uh, Tezuka area. And so I've got I've I've done a lot of uh, tests and a lot of uh, white. We we're really lacking on the white. There's other potters that are now coming up, uh, San Domingo potters who are uh, I don't know what white they are using, but there's a difference between the actual uh, spinach plant and their paints. Uh, their paints are more dark, deeper uh, black, black. So I don't know what materials are being used in that because I don't get to see them or we don't get to talk or. People don't talk about their art. So even along in here, because our, our uh, paints are very, uh, how would I put it, watery, bulky. So that's why our lines are very bulky. And then when we try to get uh, into finer lines, thin lines, then they disappear, so like in here. Yeah. We did a show in uh, Albuquerque one year, uh, some 30 years ago. But uh, that, that's what got me started doing the uh, train pots. I went around the village. Uh, at the time, there were a lot more grandmas, grandpas then. Uh, and so I got a lot of stories from them. So the stories that I got from there is what I paint onto the pots. Uh, see, back then, uh, there was nothing exciting and all, but uh, when the train comes through the village, everybody would climb the housetop just to see the train go by. <laughs> the train always went behind the church area, so I always uh, put the church on there also to represent the San Domingo area. And then the Pueblo scenery, uh, Pueblo homes. I've done one with uh, a lot of mica houses, so uh, to call it the actual cities of gold. I also paint the men that used to bring the water to the village in his wagon with barrels in the back, and the ladies with their water jars on their heads, and uh, different stories that, you know, that I collected from the early people.
they had an agreement with the train people. It says, uh, the train people, I mean, I guess uh, the train, whoever owned the trains, that the uh, people from San Domingo can get on the train and go any place that they want to free. And uh, so the uh, elders had a little meeting and said that the ladies shouldn't get on the train because if they did get on the train, they won't come back home. <laughs> That's a cute story. I don't know if it's a funny story or if it was true. On the train, I can do on the train, but not really actually the image of a whole form because um, I don't really know how to do faces and all. So it's usually just the backwards of it that I can paint. Just like the people on the housetop, I can just do an image of it without a face because they're all facing uh, east towards the train. And then also uh, the people on the uh, train. I just take my little paintbrush and do a little scribbling and then next thing images show up and I'll <laughs> Surprisingly, one time it was a Elvis Presley image. And that one I know uh, Gayo has that. It was on one of my sister's uh, fireplaces. And I've been trying to do that uh, profile of Elvis again. It just doesn't happen. And then another one with that um, Alfred Hitchcock uh, profile. Then. So that one's on, on one of the train pods. See, what uh, Grandma tells me is that um, only gods or the spirits are the ones that can create uh, human people and all. But um, for us, we can't make uh, human images. So I don't make the images at all. Perhaps painting part so far uh, hasn't really affected me because I feel that the, um, the images that I paint now there isn't uh, representing anything in Indian costumes or in, in uh, Indian images and all. It's just the... Uh, tourist people on the train and then uh, like I said just the back part of my grandmother showing pottery an image of her with her shawl on and showing pottery to the uh, tourist on the train. This one came from the uh, came from uh, Galisteo villages I mean Galisteo well the village is the area the clays came from there um, Eric Blimman takes me to those areas and you know. But we got some of this white from that area. Or maybe he might have given me the white. It, pol see, it polishes real nicely, but the black paint does not work at all. I like the, um, the finish to it. Gives it the older look. And I found this, uh, the bird, on one of the uh, picture glyphs. It was like on a step. And the bird was sort of uh, pointing towards our village. And perhaps that might be uh, a sign that that's where the people went towards that southward area, to our village. Anyhow, this is plant juice or spinach juice that I plant over the white that we got from there. But it also turned terracotta rather than white. See, the pottery, uh, like the grandmother that uh, from my father's side, she only did small things uh, for herself to use and all. So that wasn't really exciting then. And then um, once in a while, she'll give me a piece of clay and I would do small things you know, and then just to sell to the tourist item. Because in the 50s, they, had the, they were called the tourist items and they made small things and all. And they always uh, painted it with uh, commercial paints, uh, shellac and all, uh, the shinier, and uh, that's what people used to buy. You know? And uh, so that's what I used to create with my grandmother, but never really th thought about becoming a potter or doing pottery. And so when I came to school at II, the only reason I came to school at Institute of American Indian Arts was that a group came down to our school, and I was an eighth grader then, and uh, it was a choir group. So they sang, and I loved singing, and I wanted to go to that school to sing and join that chorus. I did not know what ceramics meant. I didn't know the word ceramics. I didn't take ceramics. And uh, most of the time when I was at jewelry, in the jewelry uh, classroom, I would be right next door because the jewelry and uh, ceramic classes were adjoined together. And Charles Loloma used to be the instructor then. But anyhow, it was his wife, uh, Atula Loloma, that uh, caught me uh, making a bowl in the ceramic studio one time because a lot of San Domingos used to take that uh, ceramic class. And uh, so she uh, saw me making a bowl because I knew how to do bowls with my grandma, the small things and all. And uh, so it was her that uh, rearranged my classes. And that's when I found out that ceramics meant clay, pottery. And there I learned how to throw on the wheel and all the stoneware and all the uh, glazes and all different materials and all. 
nothing like what I used to do at home because uh, at home it was just the simple clays and things and all. But here you have all the colors and the glazes that you can mix and all. So I learned how to do all that. And then um, I wanted to do designs and all. So it was uh, Atila Loloma that showed me how to use uh, a rutile stain over the pots. And then we used uh, magnesium uh, glaze. And that's what I used to use as paint. Uh, so I used to paint designs. The very first time, the designs that I painted were nothing, no sentimental look at all that. Or they were just some kind of uh, strokes that I tried to make them look like Indian designs. And I probably this size, uh, still most of this size. And when I took it home, uh, my mom got all excited. She could use that for taking food to the kivas or using it for, you know, uh, as an everyday thing and uh, serving food and things and all. And then her uh, relatives or somebody else saw one and they wanted one. So that's what got me going. I used to make nothing but stew bowls this sizes. And I will paint any kind of images on there and then it'll be glazed on the inside with white. They call it mammal. And all the San Domingos used to like that. And my mom was selling them at home. So that kept me going. I would have maybe a dollar or two dollars from her for me to spend because back then hamburgers were six for a dollar, 20 cents each, you know. So uh, the money that she gave me, you know, I kept at, at it. Uh, I knew if I make the more bowls, the more powder I make for the San Domingo lace, the more money keeps coming in because I didn't have a, a job or anything like that. But that was my spending money then. And then when I started to, um, my instructor Partington then uh, sent it pottery to uh, the Hurt Museum in 1969. And I got a ribbon there, the very first ribbon ever, and 50 whole dollars, that was a lot of money then. I called, or my mom found out somehow, because I can't call, I don't have a phone, we don't have phones at home. But anyhow, see, they came, uh, came up and I showed them the ticket or the check for 50 whole dollars and that 50 dollars went a long ways. I, we didn't know where to cash it because we didn't have bank accounts or anything but she knew of a, a people that own a, a grocery store in town where they used to sell in the plaza area there was a, in the back another block area there used to be a grocery store and they all knew the San Domingo ladies that they would shop there at the grocery store. So then that's what got me going again and then Every year we would send pottery down to the uh, Hurt Museum and to uh, Scott's Dead, and I used to win a lot of ribbons you know, from the area and cash awards and all this. And then when I tried to do Indian market uh, with stoneware, no, they won't accept my stoneware because it's not traditional. And then uh, years later, the, uh, there used to be a store there, a Kiva shop, they used to call it the Kiva shop. And it was her that told me that you should start doing San Domingo style. So I went back to grandma and she was the one that uh, started the whole process for me. Going after the clays to the hills and uh, mixing it in and all. So that's where it all started from.